Well, it's hard to do justice to these uh, marvellous papers uh, and, and uh, position statements, and I don't think I will manage to uh, cover them all, but there are certain points that I think that they have brought up beautifully, which I'll return to. The only preparation I could do this, I was told no preparation was needed, was to reread an essay by uh, Derrida um, from the 80s called The Principle of Reason, uh, the uh, uh, university in the eyes of its pupils. And I came upon a quotation um, which I had underlined long ago um, about the way in which the university um, artifact uh, has reflected society only in giving it the chance for reflection. That is also for dissociation, very interesting use of that term. The time for reflection here signifies not only that the internal rhythm of the university system is relatively independent of social time, some of us know that all too well, uh, um, but it ensures for it what he calls the great and precious freedom of play. Now, I read this, uh, my first take on this was to say how extraordinary that, date, uh, that, that statement now seems in the age of impact uh, and all that we've heard today about the economization of uh, the universities. But then, as I, I refreshed my memory of the essay, I realized that, in fact, he was already fighting a kind of rearguard action against what was being called professionalization <coughs> in the States and what was, I think, driving, um, even then, and Martin knows more about it than me, uh, uh, the pressures within the French uh, university and, and policy uh, and government uh, relations about the greater te technocratic uh, dimensions that were being demanded at the university. Martin's nodding, so I'm glad I got that right. So I think that, the, again, as we found from Michael's paper, um, a very informative work, these, some of these discussions are, are not new. Um, they come, <coughs> they've been waves uh, that uh, go back not only to the 80s and Derrida, but uh, to uh, a book which I'm uh, old enough to remember, Warwick University, Inc., uh, which was the first um, radical attempt to really uh, get at the way in which universities were being driven into the arms, as it seemed, of, as it were, car manufacturers. The fact that Warwick has done very well in the humanities may, may disprove all of those anxieties, but it was nonetheless the first inkling that universities were going to be asked to survive by, by getting into much closer relations with um, in, with industrial and commercial interests that might not have the same priorities as the universities themselves. Now, to go back to what uh, people have been talking about, people gave very interesting examples, um, and each of them, I think, told us something about the disciplines they were coming from. Um, I think Stefan gave us the wonderfully, wonderfully pithy, dispiriting proposition that universities need more money, so they were going to be asked uh, to justify themselves by getting more money. Um, and he suggested in the end a posture uh, in which one, all one could do was, was, I think I heard him right, hold one's nose. Um, maybe I got that wrong. But I, I think what he was really saying was that we needed a much more dexterous deployment of the vocabularies of argument and um, uh, less, perhaps less defensive but more and more uh, appropriate ways of thinking and talking about the value of the arts and humanities. Um, that certainly, uh, as many people have observed, that one could not really say that the exercise of skills or new findings would uh, um, uh, characterize the function of the university at the present time. In other words, I think underlying this is in some sense an, a much older debate about what the function of reflection, criticism at the present time is, and to what extent the university can possibly afford to be dissociated in the rather specialized term that Derrida, and I think utopian term in which Derrida was uh, uh, positing the possibility. I don't think the university can be dissociated in that sense. Its posture seems to be much more appropriately that of critical engagement. And I think the same goes for humanities centers. Now. Uh, Simon uh, Schretter um, gave us a really wonderful example of how historians have tried to engage in that just that kind of critical way. 
uh, by by writing. It's rather, I don't know if it's a bit like getting you know essays that you can get on the web, you know, for for your supervision. Whether having these uh, four um, thousand word uh, policy uh, essays written by experts uh, is is just so slightly uneasily related to that. I think um, uh, you know policy for sale, but I don't think he meant it like that. I think what he's saying is that that these are ways in which you can bring the rhetorical skills of historians to bear on policy issues. And he gave a very good example of how one could actually rethink something like the Industrial Revolution uh, and that uh, the uh, communication of those findings of very careful patient research actually might change policy by showing that policy had the wrong model, the wrong model of the Big Bang of the Industrial Revolution. I thought that was very instructive. Alan, I think, uh, Alan Hughes, was really, in a, in a way, pursuing the same line, which was to say that if we actually do research on how research works or how it gets into the public domain, what you find is that if you take a very narrowly econo econometric commercial view of, the, uh, of, of what that relationship might be, you find, uh, surprise, surprise, 1%, but only 10% of, of, of uh, non-humanities fields, but 1% are, are, are doing that kind of work. But if you broaden this out, you find a much more, fo a much more uh, uh, um, important kind of engagement. And I think this argument against the instrumental and in favor of a wider perspective is, is totally appropriate. Fenella, I think, Fenella Cannell, gave us a rather wonderful example of Weber, Weberian reflection um, on the, the, the function of the university, rather pessimistic one, of course, um, and in its comparative mode. And I think what she offered us was something called the comparative imagination, or something that is distinctive of the, the non-divided humanities in the much wider, wider sense uh, that includes the social sciences, as I think it should. Um, and in her example, I think she really came back to this question, well, what, you know, what is it for? What is life for? What is learning for? Um, the material understanding of the world may not uh, give us answers. And she used a very interesting word, disinterestedness, which, of course, made me think of, of Arnold. And uh, the uh, other side of that that she pointed to was the enormous importance of academic freedom and the Haldane principle, something that seems to have been forgotten. And the idea that the... ESSRC are most interested in, in these themes like economic um, um, performance and growth that are policy driven. Actually, I think it's interesting if you talk to both of those, the HRC and the ESRC, they're all very interested in the bubbling up of ideas from underneath and very worried by the way in which research is being uh, policy driven and trying to find ways around that. Um, but, but I think her point that the uh, narrowing of the range of research, uh, her, that point I think is very well taken as a risk, and that a risk that comes out of the real misunderstanding of the university, the sense in which the university has a relation to, and in some sense, a mission for the public. Martin gave us three wonderful examples of mm. la condition postmoderne, um, the, the uh, um, knowledge, uh, prophetic view, knowledge will be pr produced in order to be sold, the goal is exchange, the commodification of knowledge, and uh, um, and also, I think, a very um, charming example of the importance of foreign languages um, and of the first record and his, his, I think, lively affirmation of popular culture as well as high intellectual culture and of the connection between us. Uh, in a sense, I think he's arguing that the humanities allow us to understand the relation between Leotard, if you like, and the production of cheap, affordable records, how, again, how, how dated that seems, 1979. Um, now we have a quite other relation to, to uh, that kind of, to the dis dissemination of public culture, indeed arguments about how, how it may not be uh, possible to, uh, in any way, limit it to commercial enterprise at all. I think that what these examples show us is extraordinary mobility of mind on the part of the presenters. And I think the a uh, real attempt to deploy the different kinds of uh, weapon, if I can use that uh, term, to communicate, whether it's writing policy documents, whether it's suggesting that there are interpretations or comparisons that will always illuminate. 
the, the field of uh, um, uh, concern within universities that, are, that is not only within, but is always as well outside. And perhaps we should, I, shall, I should end, I don't see my red card yet, it must be coming up, uh, by, <laughs> by saying that I think that this sort of event is really about how you produce a discourse that is more persuasive <coughs> than the one that the HRC tried when it said, well, it's good that eight out of 100 people go to the opera uh, uh, or um, a bit of the Hadrian Wall uh, excavations have revealed us something we didn't know about the Hadrian Wall and this is a government, this is a kind of sound bite the government should be pleased about it, it gets into the heritage industry and so forth. I think that those terms have shown to be, uh, have, have been shown to be really impoverished and not helpful. And I think the development of arguments, debates and public activities, whether they're in the House of Commons or here or at the British Academy or in the newspapers, are just absolutely crucial at this moment. And the question is, is somebody listening besides ourselves? And I think that question is very important. Are they listening? Okay, I'm going to stop there.